Hetzel. The government is to publish plans to scrap parts of the post-Brexit trade arrangements for Northern Ireland. The EU says it could break international law. The Prime Minister says changes to the rules over checks on goods crossing the Irish Sea will be easy to implement, but he's faced criticism from several quarters. Not a big deal. Uh, we can fix it in such a way as to remove those bureaucratic barriers, but without putting up barriers on trade moving north-south in the island of Ireland uh, as well. It's also a new low in terms of the relationship between Britain and Ireland which is something that many of us have worked so hard uh, to protect and enhance. We'll have reaction from Brussels, also this lunchtime. Campaigners and migrants wait to hear if asylum seekers will be removed from the UK on the government's first flight to Rwanda. Farmers are urged to increase production as the government's food strategy for England is published, but there's concern it doesn't include plans to tackle obesity. As hundreds of civilians die in the Ukrainian city of Kharkiv, Amnesty International says there's evidence Russia has used cluster bombs. Gone! Well bowled. England have bowled all out for 539 by New Zealand on day four of the second test at Trent Bridge. And coming up on the BBC News Channel, Manchester City announced the signing of one of the world's most prolific marksmen. Erling Haaland joins on a five-year contract. Good afternoon, welcome to the BBC News at One. In the coming hours, the government will publish plans that would allow parts of Northern Ireland's post-Brexit trade arrangements to be altered without agreement with the EU. The Prime Minister says the government's proposed changes to the Northern Ireland Protocol amount to a trivial set of adjustments and would be relatively simple to implement. But Ireland's Foreign Minister, Simon Coveney, says plans to override the protocol would create a new set of uncertainties and be a low point in the UK's approach to Brexit. The arrangement known as the Northern Ireland Protocol allows for extra checks on goods as they cross the Irish Sea. It's been a source of discontent for unionists who see it as an internal border within the UK. Our political correspondent Jonathan Blake reports. Boris Johnson always said Brexit was about taking back control. But when it comes to the Northern Ireland border, progress has been slow. Now the Prime Minister's putting forward a plan to override parts of the deal he signed with the EU about how to manage trade across the Irish Sea. What we can do is fix that. It's not a big deal. Uh, we can fix it in such a way as to remove those bureaucratic barriers, but without putting up barriers on trade moving north-south in the island of Ireland uh, as well. That's what we want to do. The issue is getting goods from Great Britain to Northern Ireland, part of the UK of course, but with a land border to the Republic of Ireland that's in the EU. Back in 2019, Boris Johnson signed a deal to avoid checks on that border which could have threatened peace in Northern Ireland. But the government now claims it's not working and wants to change it using UK laws. The Foreign Secretary Liz Truss told her EU counterpart this morning the planned legislation would fix the problems with the Northern Ireland Protocol and restore political stability, adding the UK would prefer a negotiated solution. In response, the Vice President of the European Commission, Maros Sefcovic, said the EU had offered workable solutions and that unilateral action was damaging to mutual trust and a formula for uncertainty. The UK's nearest neighbour agrees. The UK has been in many ways a standard bearer for international law and the protection of international law for many, many years. Uh, this is damaging that rep reputation in a very fundamental way, but it's also a new low in terms of the relationship between Britain and Ireland. And Labour say this isn't the way to break the deadlock in Belfast. The answer to this is to accept there are some problems in the way the protocol works, but they could be resolved around the negotiating table with statecraft, with guile, with trust. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have those in the current Prime Minister. 
The government's plans include separate lanes for goods staying in Northern Ireland and those going on into the Republic. Ministers insist the moves would not break international law, but the EU disagrees and has warned of retaliation. Jonathan Blake, BBC News. Well, as we've heard, the current system has led to a row in Stormont with the Democratic Unionist Party refusing to allow the formation of a new devolved government until their concerns are addressed. Our island correspondent Chris Page reports. The Northern Ireland Protocol means there are checks on some goods arriving here from the rest of the UK. That's led to extra costs, processes and paperwork for businesses who get supplies from across the Irish Sea. But the protocol also gives companies in Northern Ireland an advantage. They can sell goods directly into both the British and EU markets without tariffs. The economic reality for manufacturers here, uh, for food processors and many other parts of the economy is that the protocol works incredibly well and the protocol needs reform, but it doesn't need a wrecking ball. And what's been proposed potentially today is just that. And representatives of the meat industry say removing the protocol would put at risk their ability to export. We would see the protocol as something to build on. We, we would be concerned about anything that damages trade, uh, particularly into, obviously the, the, the risk here is trade into, into Europe. Business perspectives do of course play into the political debate. But there's another aspect which is perhaps more symbolic. Unionist politicians tend to believe the union is threatened by anything which separates Northern Ireland from England, Scotland and Wales. And they view the checks carried out at the likes of Belfast Port as an economic barrier with Great Britain. The Democratic Unionist Party is preventing the devolved assembly at Stormont from meeting over its opposition to the protocol. There's no sign the DUP will soften its position when the legislation's published. What we see today will not necessarily be what comes through the process in the House of Commons and the House of Lords. We'll make our assessment of this legislation as it goes through, but I think when it comes to good faith, actually the people who need to demonstrate good faith are the government. But the Nationalist Party, which won the most seats at the recent Stormont election, says the government's being reckless. The protocol is working. There are sections of it where its application need to be finessed. There's issues around a paperwork burden and, and checks and so on. By the way, all consequences of Brexit, but the Europeans have been very clear that there will be and there has been flexibility there. And that's where all of these matters need to get resolved. Once again, Northern Ireland is at the sharp end of the fallout from Brexit and the future of devolution is at stake. Chris Page, BBC News, Belfast. Let's speak to our Brussels correspondent, uh, Jessica Parker. Uh, Jess, how strong a reaction should we expect from the EU today? Well, look, the idea of this legislation has been trailed for weeks. The idea that the UK government could override parts of the Northern Ireland Protocol has been around for even longer than that. So I don't think Brussels is going to be bowled over with surprise today. And some diplomats here suspect this is a UK negotiating tactic that's tied up with Tory party politics. But of course, they will take a look at the legislation. We expect an initial response later today and then probably a more detailed one later in the week. If the EU decides to retaliate, what might that look like? Well, it seems they could relaunch some legal action that was paused last year. And if things escalate over the course of the coming months, potentially down the line, you could see this idea of trade tariffs on UK goods. But we're a long way from that because... The legislation could take many months to get through Parliament. Likewise, EU legal action could take some time as well. In the meantime, could you see negotiations resume? The EU has suggested that it has got some further compromises to offer. It's unlikely to go far enough for the UK, however, in terms of its current demand. So I think for today, expect a lot of noise, accusations that the UK is potentially breaching international law. And in the face of that, the EU won't want to look weak in its response. Jessica, for the moment, thank you very much, Jessica Parker, in Brussels. Campaigners are making another attempt today to block the government's plans to send some asylum seekers who arrive in the UK to Rwanda. The first deportation flight is due to take off tomorrow after a High Court challenge to stop it failed. The government says the plan will deter arrivals and stop trafficking gangs. Our correspondent Sean Dilley reports. 
It's a hotel in Kigali like many others. Inside, one of the rooms made up and ready to receive their unwilling guests, refugees forcibly removed from the UK. On Friday, the High Court rejected a bid by four asylum seekers, backed by charities and the PCS Union, to seek an injunction that would stop the first flight leaving the UK tomorrow. The judge, Mr Justice Swift, ruled the Rwanda policy needs to be fully examined next month, but there was no legally compelling reason to stop tomorrow's first flight. Today, the Court of Appeal is being asked whether it will overturn that decision. Separately, another charity, Asylum Aid, is asking the court to stop the flight leaving for now because it says refugees were not given enough notice of their removal. The government, meanwhile, insists that its deal that would see Rwanda hosting and processing appeals would discourage dangerous channel crossings. Stop the plane now! But charities, opposition politicians, two archbishops and these protesters believe the government's policy is wrong. The Prince of Wales has reportedly described it as appalling. Meanwhile, the number of those due to take off tomorrow has fallen from 37 to 11, with individual legal challenges succeeding on modern slavery and human rights grounds. Home Office sources have told the BBC it's possible further challenges could see tomorrow's flight grounded, whatever happens in court today. Sean Dilley, BBC News. Our correspondent Dominic Casciani is at the High Court. Only a few hours left, Dominic, and arguments continue. Yeah, indeed, and uh, the numbers have been whittled down all the time, it appears. We started with uh, 150, maybe as many as that removal directions being served. By the time we were in court last Friday, it was down to 37 people on the flight. By the end of Friday, it was 31. This morning, we were told it was 11. We believe it's now 10. And if the charities have their way, the only people on this flight will be the pilots and the cabin crew. Now, for them to get to that stage, they've either got to win every individual case being brought by every individual asylum seeker, effectively last-minute repeals to have their cases considered in the UK, or the Court of Appeal here has got to say, hang on, let's put the brakes on this before a final larger hearing in July. Now, the government says that is not necessary. There is no compelling reason to stop this flight because wider questions about Rwanda's conditions there for later uh, for next month let's wait for that hearing but in the meantime let this flight take off so there's a lot riding on today's hearing but even if this one goes against the campaigners they could be back here again later this afternoon with another case and also tomorrow morning so this is going to go on and on until this flight finally leaves the ground if at all tomorrow evening Dominic thank you Dominic Casciani at the High Court the latest official figures show that the UK economy shrank for the second month in a row in April. The Office for National Statistics says GDP was down 0.3% compared with a fall of 0.1% in March. Our economics correspondent Andy Verity is here. So Andy, how many sectors of the economy have seen the shrink? short answer is every sector, the whole economy. We should stress these are monthly figures. They do wobble around. They're not quite as reliable as the three-month figure. But even then, when you look at the picture, it's not good. So if you look, for example, at services, which is four-fifths of the economy, and you can see that activity there has actually shrunk by 0.3%. A large part of that was because the government was spending less money on test and trace because it was wound down. But if you look at the other sectors too, production, which is manufacturing and oil and gas, now that was down by 0.6%. Part of the reason there is what we've been talking about for weeks now, supply disruptions. In the car industry, they've struggled to get the parts. And the supply difficulties also in the oil and gas industry, partly because of the war in Ukraine, of course. Then you look at other sectors like, for example, construction. That too is down by 0.4%. So every sector of the economy is down. First time that's happened since January 2021 when we were in renewed lockdown, if you remember. And broadly, the picture here is that the economy is looking weaker than most economists were expecting. We haven't had any growth for three months. Nevertheless, we have the Bank of England meeting on Thursday and they're expected to raise interest rates just because they're so concerned about that 40-year inflation. But possibly, because of this weakness, they'll raise them by a quarter of a percentage point rather than half. Andy, thank you very much. Andy Verity. Ukraine says its forces have pushed back from the centre of the key industrial city, Severodonetsk, where President Volodymyr Zelensky says they were fighting for literally every metre. It comes as Russia is accused of killing hundreds of civilians in Ukraine's second biggest city, Kharkiv, through indiscriminate shelling. Amnesty International says it has evidence that cluster bombs have been used. These weapons are banned by more than 100 countries, but not by Russia.
Our correspondent, Wira Davis, reports. From the very start of this war, the city of Kharkiv bore the brunt of Russian shelling. Often indiscriminate and wildly inaccurate. This at a junction outside a large public hospital. In Saltivka, one of Kharkiv's northern suburbs, there's barely a building undamaged. In these areas, says Amnesty International, the routine use of unguided rockets by Russian forces in built-up residential suburbs resulted in hundreds of casualties. Those who survived the onslaught left. Those who now return do so only briefly. It was horrible. Horrible. When the Russians were firing, you would get thrown into the air from your chair. It's hard to describe, but that's what it was like. 20 miles from the border, Kharkiv was a key Russian target in the early weeks of the war, and they literally threw everything at this city, including widely banned weapons, indiscriminate by their very nature. The world has made these weapons illegal because they are so devastating and indiscriminate and mainly affect uh, civilians. There can be no reason legally or morally to use cluster munitions in Ukraine or anywhere else. This demonstrates the indiscriminate destruction that cluster munitions can bring. A large shell explodes, casting off dozens of smaller bomblets. As they then explode over a certain area, they shower people and buildings with thousands of pieces of shrapnel. In this case, Kharkiv's Children's Hospital. Some of those struck down by cluster munitions and Russian shells are now recovering in city hospitals. There was a hole in my leg the size of a fist, says Roman, who tells me how he fell to the ground, convinced he was going to die as several other cluster bombs exploded around him. According to the regional medical director, more than 600 civilians have been killed and 1,200 injured in Kharkiv alone. The material damage to this city's infrastructure too is obvious, all of which, says Amnesty, may constitute a war crime. Wura Davis, BBC News, Kharkiv. The time is 17 minutes past one. Our top story this lunchtime. The Prime Minister says changes to the rules over checks on goods crossing the Irish Sea will be easy to implement. The EU says it could break international law. Still to come, England are bowled out for 539 by New Zealand on day four of the second test at Trent Bridge. Coming up on the BBC News Channel, Liverpool agree a deal with Benfica to sign Uruguay striker Darwin Nunez on a deal that could cost up to £84 million. The long-awaited plan to transform England's food system was published this morning, with the government promising to put farmers and food security at the heart of their reforms. The Prime Minister denied criticism that the plan fails to tackle obesity by leaving out a recommended tax on sugar and salt, saying the best way to lose weight was to eat less. Claire Marshall takes a look at what else is included in the paper. Courgette City. Hello. The Prime Minister was on a courgette farm near Hale in Cornwall for the media this morning for the launch of the government's national food strategy. It's the plan for how our food gets from the fields to our forks. At its heart, the government says, are the farmers. You've got to make sure that you do is that you look after UK uh, food and farming and recognise that we have an opportunity to eat much more of what we grow in this country. In the white paper is a framework for farming the land sustainably, trying to take care of nature and tackle climate change. More locally grown or higher standard food, there'll be a consultation on whether this is where the public sector, hospitals, schools and care homes should be spending its food budget. There'll be a review of the labour shortage, including using more machines and issuing more visas for migrants. This is an organic farm near Swindon. These pigs currently provide high-quality meat for national supermarkets, but could they soon go into meals for local schools? These pigs have been bred and reared outdoors, and they're given minimal amounts of antibiotics. 
Until now, this style of organic farming has been seen as more niche. But if today's strategy document is to be believed, then they could move more into the mainstream. But there is not enough detail, according to the man who led a major review into our food system. I think it's progress, particularly on the environment. There are some really important policies. It's a list of policies, not a strategy, though. And it needs to be bolder on the environment. And on health, we're waiting. It's been kicked down the line. We're waiting for what the health secretary says on health. Some wildlife groups are saying that the government has broken its promise to restore nature and help biodiversity. But after withering criticism of an earlier leaked draft, the National Farmers Union is now behind the plans. I think it's really welcome to see government committing to food production and food security. There's a strong commitment in there to maintain our current levels of self-sufficiency and to produce more effectively of what we're good at. However, Britain is in the grip of an obesity crisis and many campaigners are asking what happened to the proposed sugar and salt tax. According to the government, these will be addressed in another white paper at a later date. Claire Marshall, BBC News, Wiltshire. The Labour leader, Sir Keir Starmer, is to be investigated over potential breaches of rules on gifts and earnings. Parliament Standards Commissioner is investigating whether Sir Keir broke the House of Commons Code of Conduct. MPs must declare within 28 days any interest that might be reasonably considered to influence their actions. Sir Keir appears to have missed this deadline on several occasions. He says he's confident, though, that no rules have been broken. Let's speak to our political correspondent, Nick Erdley. Nick, exactly what is being claimed here? Hi, Martine. Well, it was a simple update on the Standard Commissioner's website which told us that these investigations were going on. She doesn't provide details of what exactly she's looking at. My understanding is, is this refers to the late declaration of some payments around a, a book that Sir Keir Starmer is writing and some football tickets that he was given as a gift. Now, the Labour Party, a spokesperson for Sir Keir, has said this morning that he takes his declaration very seriously, has apologised to the Commissioner for some of these late declarations and has been asked to provide more information, which he will do. Sir Keir himself has said that he's confident that there is no issue here. It's worth bearing in mind that there have been a lot of previous investigations into things like this. The Prime Minister has been uh, reprimanded in the past for not de declaring his interests in time. But just remember, Sir Keir Starmer is someone that some of his Cabinet colleagues call Mr Rules. The fact that he appears to have fallen foul of them, even if it's in a fairly minor way, is pretty embarrassing. Nick, for the moment, thank you. Nick Hurdley. The Brexit campaigner Aaron Banks has lost a libel claim that he brought against the investigative journalist Carol Cadwallader. Mr Banks, who founded the pro-Brexit campaign group Leave.eu, sued Ms Cadwallader for defamation over two instances in 2019. Mr Banks claimed that he was defamed after comments Ms Cadwallader made about his relationship with the Russian state. Police in Brazil say they've found items belonging to the British journalist Dom Phillips and his travelling companion, the indigenous specialist Bruno Ferreira. They disappeared in the Amazon last week. The development comes as the family of Mr Phillips have said their hopes of finding him alive have faded. Our South America correspondent Katie Watson reports. It was along this stretch of water that Dom Phillips and Bruno Ferreira disappeared. The vastness of the Amazon plain to sea. The armed forces are out searching, so too are the indigenous communities, many of whom knew Bruno personally. He helped train indigenous groups to defend themselves against the increasing threat of illegal fishermen and poachers. Dom Phillips was writing a book, which was why the two men were travelling together, Bruno introducing Dom to people he knew. The indigenous community has set up camp near where they disappeared. We were asked not to identify anyone because they fear reprisals. A fisherman financed by the narcos will do what they probably did to Bruno and their life because they see us as an obstacle. Our river guide is Felipe. He and his father run a fishing tourism business and the two men were staying in their small hotel. Don was really interested in the environment and was passionate about the Amazon and told us what he was writing, Felipe tells me. He interviewed us and asked us about our work. Upriver, we come across a search team focused on a small area. 
The indigenous teams alongside, they know the terrain better than anyone. There's a police boat in the distance. Uh, beyond that, there's another one further into the jungle. We've been told we can't go any further, but clearly there's something they're looking at. They've been here for several hours now. Shortly after, it's sealed off. We were told later that this was where Bruno and Dom's belongings were found. The search teams continue, but these new developments point to a devastating conclusion and hopes faded of finding the two men alive. Katie Watson, BBC News, in Valle de Javari. An Australian newspaper has removed an article and its writer has offered an apology after being accused of outing the actor Rebel Wilson. On Friday, Rebel Wilson said that she had found her Disney princess as she shared a selfie with her girlfriend on Instagram. But on Saturday, the paper revealed it had known about the relationship before it was public and had given her two days to comment. That report sparked widespread criticism on social media. A judge at the High Court has ruled that life support treatment for a 12-year-old boy who'd suffered brain damage should stop. Archie Battersby's parents had wanted his treatment to continue, but doctors at the Royal London Hospital say that he's clinically dead. His family have just given their reaction. I do not believe Archie has been given enough time. From the beginning, I have always thought, what is the rush? His heart is still beating, he has gripped my hand and there's his mother and my gut instinct, I know my son is still there. Holly Dance, the mother of Archie Battersby. After an action-packed start to the fourth day of the second test in Nottingham, England were bowled out for 539 runs by New Zealand. At lunch, the tourists have reached 27 for one in their second innings with a lead of 41 runs. Patrick Geary reports. No wonder Joe Root couldn't wait to get out there. This is an athlete at his peak, the kind of form where everything you touch flies. Unbelievable from Joe Root. He doesn't captain England anymore, but through his batting, he still leads them. Ben Folkes followed in his wake past 50. England's deficit just above 40. Could they build a lead? It's at such moments of confidence when you can tend to overreach. Root out out of nowhere. He'd scored 176, but that only made him want more. With him went England's momentum. Now New Zealand took off. Daryl Mitchell somehow grabbed Stuart Broad. What had been clear was now muddled. Matthew Potts was looking to score his first run in Test cricket. Then he changed his mind and asked folks to change direction. Too late. And too little for England as well, considering where they'd been. All out, still 14 runs behind. New Zealand batting the match, beginning to move. Too much for Tom Latham. Oh, he's knocked him over! Jimmy Anderson's 650th test wicket. When you've taken that many, you can feel an opportunity. Both he and England will sense a chance after lunch. Patrick Geary, BBC News. Time for a look at the weather forecast. And Susan has joined us with a picture, hopefully, of things to come. You're not wrong, actually. The, well, actually, this is today outside now. There's some patchy clouds skittering around across our skies, but there is still some decent sunshine to be had out there. If we take a look at our satellite picture, you'll see that in just a moment. But as this week goes on, if anything, I think Martin's right, more in the way of sun to come and possibly the most surprising thing will eventually be some significant heat. Here we are this afternoon. There's patchy cloud developing across England and Wales, some rather more solid cloud to the northwest of the UK, keeping things pretty grey across Western Scotland this afternoon. A little bit of light rain here. Elsewhere, dry. Our temperatures around average for the time of year in the sunshine, low 20s at best. But there is a heat wave across Spain at the moment. Today, temperatures above 40 degrees here into the mid 40s. By midweek, that heat heads into Central Europe pushing across France by Friday it is heading our way and 30 degrees is perfectly possible across uh, quite large swathes of England and Wales on Friday we'll see how we get there in just a moment back to this afternoon and it's uh, fairly much business as usual our temperatures are will slide down the teens scale as we go through the evening with some late sunshine. By the end of the night, they'll be sitting somewhere between the 9 to 12 degree mark. I think there could be a few clearer spells around across England and Wales by the end of the night. Still some th 
thick a cloud and some rain for the northwest of Scotland. And that is just going to linger on through Tuesday, unfortunately. So it always stays slightly cooler here, rather grey and wet. Further south, high pressure actually, I think, will allow us to see more in the way of sunshine across England and Wales on Tuesday. Some brighter spells for Northern Ireland as well. And the temperature's already starting to creep up by a couple of degrees. I think we could see perhaps 24 in the southeast of England Tuesday afternoon. Just 14, though, for Stornoway underneath those thicker clouds. Wednesday, not going to have too dramatic a difference either. It's later in the week the heat will build. Hay fever sufferers, not a great day for you on Tuesday. Very high levels of pollen across England and Wales. Under the cloud across Scotland, we are looking at much lower levels. Here's Wednesday, pretty similar, isn't it? We've got perhaps a little bit more cloud filling in again across England and Wales on Wednesday. We've still got some greyer skies to the far northwest, but the temperatures creeping, creeping all the while, getting further up the 20 scale towards the far southeast. It's at the end of the week, though, as we see low pressure trying to come in from the west, picking up that plume of warm air from further south across the continent, straight across England and Wales, but thunderstorms butt up against that warmer air coming south uh, from Northern Ireland and Scotland. So for the end of the week, 30, 31 degrees across parts of uh, Wales and southern England. A damper story for Scotland and Northern Ireland. And then we'll see that rain working its way south, mixing with the hotter air, turning things pretty thundery and lively, I think, overnight Friday into the start of the weekend. And for those of you that don't like the heat, that should see things cooling off as well. So uh, all change this week. We start off uh, fairly ambivalently. We hot up. And then by Saturday, we're back to square one. More tea. <laughs> nice for some, not for everybody. Oh. Susan, thank you very much. A reminder of our top story this lunchtime. The Prime Minister says changes to the rules over checks on goods crossing the Irish Sea will be easy to implement. The EU says it could break international law. Not a big deal. Uh, we can fix it in such a way as to remove those bureaucratic barriers, but without putting up barriers on trade moving north-south in the island of Ireland uh, as well. It's also a new low in terms of the relationship between Britain and Ireland, which is something that many of us have worked so hard uh, to protect and enhance. Well, that's all from the BBC News at One. So it's goodbye from me and on BBC One. We now join the BBC's news teams where you are. <laughs>